welcome everybody to online worship here at Cedar Creek. And whether you're a regular part of the Cedar Creek Church family or you just found us online for the first time, we want you to know we're so glad that you're here. And our hope is that our little bit of time that we spend together today would uh, bring you some encouragement, maybe offer you some hope, but also maybe challenge you to take a next step in your journey back to God. You know, the word that I keep hearing over and over these last couple of weeks is the word unprecedented. These are unprecedented times. These are unprecedented measures that we are having to take to keep ourselves safe from this virus. And and that is true. You know, unprecedented is just a fancy way of saying we've never been here before. You know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. And so because of that, the uncertainty that we're dealing with creates fear and frustration. Fear because we don't know what's next, what's around the corner. And Frustration because it's hard to plan and prepare when you don't know what you don't know. And right now, it's just not possible to be prepared completely, to know everything that you need to do or or that you shouldn't do. That is the reality of this current situation. But you know, I've been thinking a lot this past week that in some sense, isn't life always unpredictable? I mean, we never really know what a a new day brings. I I can tell you from my own experiences that the reality is that we're all always just one phone call away from our lives changing forever. And so in a sense, I think this virus has basically just pulled back the curtain. It's just kind of remove this illusion that we have often of control, that we know what's coming when the truth is that we don't. And so while in this crisis we may feel a a desperation, the truth is we always have a need for something bigger than ourselves. We we have a need for a a peace that transcends our circumstances. We we have a need for an anchor, for a, a source of hope that is bigger than the things we go through. And that is exactly what Jesus offers to every one of us. In fact, listen to what he says in John 14, 27. Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift. And what is that gift? Peace of mind and heart. And then notice what he says. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. You can't find that in managing your circumstances. You can't find that in the illusion of control. And so because of that, Jesus says, so don't be troubled or afraid. Listen, I I wish I could sit here and tell you that over these last couple of weeks, because of my faith and my relationship with Jesus, that I haven't dealt with any fear or anxiety or frustration, but that wouldn't be true. Almost every day, in some way, at some point, I can feel fear and anxiety rising. I can feel myself wrestling with frustration. And when those times come, I have also discovered that because of my relationship with Jesus, if I will just stop and make the choice to focus on Him, to lean into my relationship with Him, that he begins to exchange that fear, that frustration, that anxiety with peace and hope. And I want all of us to experience that. I want to encourage you, whatever you're feeling during these difficult times, when you feel anxiety, when you feel frustration in your life, just keep your eyes on Jesus. Lean in to him through prayer, through spending time in his word, reminding yourself, or maybe for some of you, discovering for the first time these amazing promises that he offers. And as you do, when you do, you will start to find that peace that he promises. Peace in your heart, peace in your emotions, and peace in your minds. You know, one of the ways that I know that God is sovereign, that he is in control, 
that this pandemic did not take him by surprise. In fact, I know that God has always had a plan and a purpose to work in and through these current circumstances. One of the reasons I know that is because the unique way that God has positioned our church. I mean, when all this stuff hit, we were right in the middle of this whole be the church emphasis where we were talking about not just coming to church, but being the church wherever we are. And so these obstacles that this pandemic has created are, are actually great opportunities for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. You know, as I've watched you guys on Facebook and social media and talked to many of you, I have been amazed at the creative and practical ways you've come up with to show love to the people around you, to serve the needs of people around you, even during this quarantine. And so today, rather than me sitting up here and talking about actions that we can take to be the church, things we can do to serve others, I want to talk about the attitude we have to have to be the church. Because truly serving others is all about our attitude. That, that's where it starts. In fact, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 20, 28. He says, your attitude must be like my own. For I, the Messiah, the Savior, did not come to be served, but to what? What does that say? To serve. Do you see that connection between the attitude and the actions of serving? There are certain attitudes that Jesus had that moved him to serve others when he was here on this earth. And those are the same kinds of attitudes that we're going to have to develop if we truly want to be the church, if we really want to serve and love the people around us. And there are many attitudes we could talk about, but I just want to look at three. Three key attitudes to serving others well. I think the first attitude we have to have is humble. We have to be humble if we're going to serve others well. Humility is an essential element to serving others. And you see that so clearly in Jesus' life. In fact, look at what the Bible says in Philippians 2.8. It says, and when he, when Jesus was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God. Think about that for a minute. I mean, here is Jesus. He is literally God in the flesh. And because of that, he has access to unlimited power, unlimited wealth, unlimited resources. And yet, Jesus' entire life is marked by humility. From his birth in a, in a manger, in a stall with animals, to his childhood in a simple carpenter's home in a backwater village of Nazareth. Even Jesus' public ministry was a very humble operation. You know, he didn't have a big temple. He didn't have all kinds of ministry plans and events. And he didn't have this big, huge ministry publicly. It was just Jesus and 12 guys traveling around, pretty much homeless, moving from village to village. Nobody's from nowhere. And yet, he changed the world. And the reason he changed the world is because he served the world. And the reason that he served the world is because he humbled himself. And so if we're going to serve well, it's got to start with an attitude of humility. You know, you, those of you that are regular Cedar Creekers, you've heard me say this tons of times. That humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is just thinking of yourself less. But let's get real. That's hard to do. Especially in this culture that we live in that tells us regularly, it's all about you. Have it your way. And then when we face a crisis like the one we're in now, that just escalates this all about me, this self-centeredness that we all struggle with. 
I mean, just look at how we've behaved over these last couple of weeks. You know, we, we buy way more toilet paper than we could ever need, way more meat, and we are just, you know, raiding the grocery stores, stocking up for ourselves and for our family. And look, I'm not saying that it's wrong to meet the needs of your family and be prepared. Obviously, we should do that. What I am saying is that if we really want to be the church, then our attitude needs to be about more than just me. It's got to start with an attitude of humility. The second attitude we have to have to serve others well is to be available. An attitude of availability. Now, some of you I know are thinking, Philip, availability not, is not an attitude. That's an action. Availability is something that you do. Yes, but I would say it is both an action and an attitude. Because being available requires an attitude of being willing to be available, be interrupted for the people around you. Uh, one of the greatest pictures of this in Jesus' life actually takes place during the, or right before the very last week of his life here on earth. The, the Passion Week, the Passover Week, the, the week that we'll celebrate beginning next Sunday. And if you could have gotten a hold of Jesus' iPhone and pulled up his Google Calendar, you would see that that week was jam-packed. I mean, it starts off, he's got the whole triumphal entry parade with the people waving palm branches and singing Hosanna. And then right after that, he's got the whole clearing of the temple where he's got to make a whip and turn over the tables of the money changers. And then on top of that, he's got the whole Last Supper to plan He's got to book a room, he's got to get a caterer, and then on top of all that, he's got to be arrested, he's got to go through three trials, be beaten, crucified, dead and buried for three days, and then be resurrected. I mean, by any standards, this is a packed week. And yet Jesus, literally walking to Jerusalem with all of this stuff on his to-do list, has an amazing encounter with two guys in need. Notice Matthew 20. It says, Two blind men were sitting beside the road, and when they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he stopped. Do you see that? He stopped, and he called out to them, What do you want me to do for you? Think about that. All the stuff Jesus has on his schedule, and yet he is willing to be interrupted. He's willing to be available to meet the needs of two blind guys sitting on the side of the road begging. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, you'll discover that the vast majority of Jesus' miracles were interruptions. What I mean by that is that he was on his way to do something that he had planned and somebody with a need interrupted him. And that's often when God's power showed up most in Jesus' life. I think that same thing is true for us. And, and maybe especially during this time of crisis. I think some of our greatest opportunities to be the church in these days and maybe weeks, maybe even months ahead, will be interruptions to the things that we have planned. There'll often be inconveniences for us personally, but there are also great opportunities to serve others. The question is, will we have an attitude of availability? And then finally, number three, the third attitude that we have to have to serve others well is to be grateful. We have to have an attitude of gratitude, which to me kind of seems backwards, right? If I'm serving somebody, shouldn't they be the ones who are grateful? I mean, if I'm helping them, shouldn't they be grateful to me? But the Bible is clear that we should be grateful for the opportunity to serve others. We should be grateful for the opportunity for God to use us. I mean, take the Apostle Paul, for example. 
Probably the most well-known, most impactful follower of Jesus ever. I mean, other than Jesus himself, no one individual had a greater impact on the kingdom and on the church than Paul. And yet, look at what he writes to his young protege, Pastor Timothy. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because he has given me strength to do his work. Because he considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. I think that's how true servants think. Grateful for the opportunity to serve. Grateful for the opportunity to be used by God. You know, we have a lot of ministries here at Cedar Creek Church. And on a a normal Sunday across all of our campuses, there are hundreds of volunteers who serve to pull off our services. We have folks serving in guest services, children's ministry, Kids Creek, Center Point, student ministry, all over on Sundays, on all of our campuses. Not to mention the hundreds, perhaps thousands, who serve out in our community working with our local partners, serving in our community. And with all of these volunteers doing all of these different acts of service, one thing that I have noticed repeatedly over and over is that the the volunteers who have the greatest impact, the volunteers who get the greatest joy out of their service are those who are grateful for the opportunity to serve. They're not serving out of duty or obligation or, you know, to try to impress God. They're just grateful for the opportunity to make a difference and be used by God. You know, if we're not careful, our service to others can just be a smokescreen for our own self-centeredness. What I mean by that is sometimes we serve out of a a need for our own affirmation, to be recognized, to people to notice us, to pat us on the back. Now, there's nothing wrong with being recognized for the service you do. In fact, here at Cedar Creek, we try to affirm and encourage and recognize our volunteers and the great work that they do. But if that's the motivation, if if that's the heart behind our service, It won't last. Because if you're serving to meet some need for affirmation, there'll come a point when there'll never be enough affirmation. If you're serving so that others will recognize you and pat you on the back, there's never going to be enough recognition. You're going to have to serve in ways that nobody else sees. But God sees And in fact, I'm convinced God probably works a lot more through our unseen acts of service than through our big public acts of service. I guess what I'm saying is that when it comes to serving others, never confuse anonymity with insignificance. Because there's no insignificant service if it's done with the right heart with the right motives, if it's done to honor God with your life. That's probably where your most impactful service will come. All of us know the name Billy Graham, but I bet few, if any of us, know the name of that usher who helped Billy Graham and his friend when they were teenagers get a seat at a packed revival meeting And where Billy Graham gave his heart to Jesus and launched a a career and a ministry that shared the gospel with billions. But God sees those. Those types of serving have a huge impact. See, I'm convinced that during this time of crisis, really all of the time, but especially during this time of crisis, that God wants to use you to make a huge impact. He wants to use you to impact your family, our community, maybe even the world. I know some of you are saying, well, Philip, you don't know me. You don't know how shy I am or that I have no talents or you don't know where I've been. You don't know the things I've done in my life. And you're right. I don't know that. 
But I know God used a murderer by the name of Moses. God used an unfaithful adulterer by the name of David. God used an impulsive fisherman by the name of Peter. See, it's not about who you are. It's about who Jesus is. And the level that you are willing to surrender and submit and be led by him. And for that to happen, we're going to have to develop a humble heart. We're going to have a, have an attitude of availability. And we're going to have to be grateful for whatever opportunities God brings our way. Because that is really the heart of what it means to truly be the church. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray for every single person that's watching this. Whatever emotions they're dealing with, whatever circumstances they're wrestling with, Lord, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. That you would pour out your peace and your presence and your power. That they would see you in a way that they've never seen you before. And they would be drawn to you by your incredible love for them. And that they would be moved to serve out of love. That you would open all of our eyes to see the needs in our homes and our neighborhoods during this unprecedented time of isolation and quarantine. God, I know you're opening doors. Help us to see where you want us to serve. But more than that, Lord, help us develop the attitude of Jesus so that we might serve in a way that truly makes a difference. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.